Deuteronomy 33. And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, The Lord came from Sinai, and rose up from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousand of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. Yea, he loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand, and they sat down at thy feet. Every one shall receive of thy works. Words. Moses commanded us a law, even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. And he was king and drew so on. When the heads of the people and the tribes of Israel were gathered together, let Reben live and not die, and let not his men be few. And this is the blessing of Judah. And he said, Hear, Lord, the voice of Judah, and bring him unto his people. Let his hands be sufficient for him, and be thou an help to him from his enemies. And of Le Levi he said, Let thy thigh men and thy urim be with thy holy one, whom thou didst prove at Massa, and with whom thou didst strive at the waters of Marabah, who said unto his father and to his mother, I have not seen him, neither did he acknowledge his brethren, nor knew his own children, for they have observed thy word and kept thy covenant. They shall teach Jacob thy judgments, and Israel thy law. Thou shalt put incense before thee, and whole burnt sacrifice upon thine altar. Bless, Lord, his substance, and accept the work of his hands. Smite through the loins of them that rise against him, and of them that hate him, and that they rise not again. And of Benjamin, he said, Thy beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him, and the Lord shall cover him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. And of Joseph, he said, Blessed of the Lord, be his land, for the precious things of heaven, for the dew, and for the deep that croacheth beneath it, and for the precious fruits brought forth by the sun, and for the precious things put forth by the moon, and for the chief things of the ancient mountains, and for the precious things of the lasting hills, and for the precious things of the earth and fullness thereof, and for the good will of him that dwelt in the bush. Let the blessing come upon the hand of Joseph, head of Joseph, and upon the top of the head of him that was separated from his brethren. His glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth, and they are the ten thousand of Ephraim, and they are the ten thousand of Manasseh, and of Zebulun. He said, Rejoice, Zebulon, in thy going out, and in Sakar, in thy tents. They shall call the people unto the mountain. There they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness, for they shall suck of the abundance of the seas, and of the treasures hid in the sand. And of Gad he said, Blessed be he that enlargeth Gad. He dwelleth as a lion, and teareth the arm with the crown of the head. And he provided the first part for himself, because there, in a portion of the lawgiver, was he seated. And he came with the heads of the people. He executed the justice of the Lord and his judgments with Israel. And of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp. He shall leap from Bashan. And of Nephtilah, he said, O Nephtilah, suffused with favor and full with the blessing of the Lord. Possess thou the west and the south. And of Ashar, he said, Let Ashar be blessed with children. Let him be acceptable to his brethren, and let him dip his foot in oil. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass, and as thy days, so shall thy strength be. There is none like unto the God of Jerusalem, who rideth upon the heaven in thy help, and in his excellency on the sky. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, and she th and shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, Destroy them. Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be upon a land of corn and wine. Also his heavens shall drop down dew. Happy art thou, O Israel, whom is like unto thee, O people saved by the Lord, 
the shield of thy help, and who is the sword of thy excellently. And thine enemies shall be found liars unto thee, and thou shalt tread upon the high places. Amen. Lord willing, I will finish out the book of Deuteronomy today. So it's been quite some time we've been studying this book. Uh, show of hands, who looks at Deuteronomy a little bit differently than they did before? Is it, does it, it seems a little bit different of a book than what you expected, Me, myself as well. Deuteronomy to me was always just this book of laws. It was this Old Testament archaic thing that was for them and not for me. And yet now as we've studied through it in its entirety, I, I'm sad to see it go. I'm sad to be over it because um, this, this book is more practical today than I could have ever imagined when I started this, this study. It was, very, it was very daunting to even, even um, I believe, accept the call of God and, and the instruction to go forth and teach this book because I'm like, oh man, is, are the people going to even want to hear this? Am I going to want to study this? Is it going to be difficult and challenging like an uphill battle? But it really wasn't. It was, it was a blessing. And um, the wonderful thing about this book is it ends in that same thing. It ends in a blessing. It's, it's not just this... this um, you know, people will, will label God this mean Old Testament God, and then when Jesus came, he was all peace and love. But you read through Deuteronomy, and it's not that at all. He just, he has standards for us. But every time he shows his standard for us, he attributes a blessing to company with it. And we all want the blessings of God in our life. We all want him to, 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 be, to be interacting in a positive way, to be encouraging and strengthening us to, to live out our days in this earth. And, and to be blessed and to, and to have fruitfulness and have riches and have all the good things that this world has to offer. And we see very clearly from a book like Deuteronomy, it comes from us simply by faith, believing the word and doing what it says to the best of our ability, being quick to repent whenever we fall short of it. And that's, that's easy. That's, that's simple instruction. And that's Christianity in a nutshell. And that's the blessing that I got from a book like this. So he begins in verse 1 here. And says, and this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. So as we know, Moses is about to die. He was instructed of God that the day of his death is nigh at hand. So he makes this song. And the song, by and large, was about judgment and warnings for judgment for, for disobedience and that type of thing. Exalting God and showing his severity. And while there is goodness involved in God, there is also severity in how he deals with us in this area. And for me personally, and I think we could all sort of agree with this, we respond much better to, to curses, to correction, to, to chastisement than we do just being blessed by our Lord. Too often in our lives, we get down the wrong path, and it's not going to be God just completely blessing us in that path that's going to bring us to realize his goodness. No, it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And his goodness too often for us is actually his chastening hand, his, his correcting us, his steering us back, his rebuke towards us. And all those things help us to walk a straight and narrow. And I need that. And I think we could all admit that we need that. Children need that, right? Children don't react, you know, if you want a child to straighten up and fly right and do things a different way. You don't just give them candy. You don't just give them more freedoms. You don't do, children don't react to that. It, it almost emboldens them to continue in that path. Chastening and correction, that's what instructs a child into righteousness. And the same is true for us. But God always takes his instruction on the negative aspect that he must do in order to correct us with the blessing that results as, a, as we do that, those things. As we do right, as we live right. So we're contrasting here in Deuteronomy 33 as we round out this book with the strong warning that we've seen previous and the imminent curses to this blessing that God begins to give to his people through Moses as he was a dying. We're preparing to receive a promise. And these people were preparing to receive of a blessing as they entered into the very land that God had promised him. And so Moses was instructed by God as the man of God to come and to pronounce the blessings to these people. Verse 2 it says, and he said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran and came with ten thousands of saints from his right hand when a fiery law for them. So here he's highlighting his presence with the people of God 
from all the way back when he first brought them out of Egypt to now. He says the Lord came from Sinai, and that was when he first talked to Moses in the burning bush. That was when he first issued the commandments to these people. He came from Sinai, rose up from Seir unto them. It says he shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of his saints. There, he's coupled with his people as he walks forward with them. Always with his people. Always dwelling among his people. And he says at the end of that verse, from his right hand went a fiery law for them. Now, whenever you see the right hand in scriptures, what you have is a picture of authority. They rule with their right hand. It was often kings in antiquity that when they raised their right hand, that was when something was about to be done. That was when they were going to speak. That was when they were going to instruct. That's the authority that comes from the right hand of God as well. It shows power and strength. Most people, I believe, are right-handed. And, and, if, and if I'm going to throw a ball, I'd much rather throw it with my right hand than my left hand because that's, that's where my power and strength comes from. It would just look awkward for it to come from the opposite hand. And so God is, is indicating the same. He's got power and strength there in that right hand. And also, there's a, there's a given priority. When God refers to um, somebody that is in great favor with him, in Christ himself, he says, he's at my right hand that I shall not be moved. There's, there's authority, there's power and strength, and there's priority given when God talks of his right hand. And he said, from his right hand went a fiery law for them. So the mount burned with fire, the law came down as it was penned upon that table of stone, not once, but twice, unfortunately, because the first was broken. But... Nevertheless, that's what God indicates here. His law has authority. His law has power and strength. His law should be given a priority when we deal with God. And it is of the highest priority in his mind, I think so. That very law is the schoolmaster that leads us to Christ. It instructs us in righteousness, shows us that we are far from righteousness and therefore need a Savior. So he continues on then in verse 3 and it says, Yea, he loved the people. All his saints are in his hand, and they sat down at thy feet. Every one shall receive of his words. And I love that. When God just outright says it, he loves his people. You know Allah never said he loved his people? You know many plethora of, of, of so-called gods out there in the world do not have what Christianity has, and that is a God that loves them. Of course, God loved the whole world, and so he extends his love to the Muslims that worship a God that doesn't love them. And he extends his love towards the Catholics that worship a God that doesn't love them. And he extends his love toward anybody who all has made gods and set up idols in their own hearts and in their own minds that do not love them. An idol does not have hands or, or eyes or, or, or any faculties whereby they could exhibit love to their people. And this is the world at large. But God, he says here, he loved the people. He loves the people. And then he says this, above the people that he loved, all of his saints are in his hand. So he loves the world and then keeps his saints close and in his hand, in his strength, under his authority, and, and gives priority unto them. That shows of God's care and of his provision. It says also here that they're at his feet. When we are at his feet, we are under him. We are in his leadership. We are in his protection. To be at the hands or at the feet of God, to be kneeling beneath him. And even for us as Christians, we think of being at the foot of the cross. And that's where we look to for our strength and for our sufficiency in Christ. That's where our protection comes from, from the fact that he paid it all and all to him we owe. We're protected there at his feet. And it says also here at the end of verse 3 that we are set to receive his words. Everyone shall receive of thy word. Everyone shall receive of thy word. And his voice gives the Christian guidance and exhortation. His voice also comes and speaks in condemnation to those that would reject him. His word will be received then by everybody, I believe is what it's indicating here. From the least and to the greatest, from those that love God and seek Him and serve Him to those that reject Him outright. They will ultimately hear of His words one day or another and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father in that day. Continuing on in verse 4, it says, Moses commanded us a law, even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. So he commanded this law and it's also coupled with an inheritance that they have. Verse 5, it says, And he was king in Jeshurun when the heads of the people 
and the tribes of Israel were gathered together. So Moses here commanded a law, and it says that he ruled as a king over the assembly. Now, keep your finger there, and we can go to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. I just wanted to get a little bit of a snapshot at the uh, beginnings of all of this, when it all started. In Exodus chapter 3, it speaks of Moses there simply keeping a flock. Verse 1 of Exodus chapter 3, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priests of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even Horeb. So Moses had been given a charge by God that he would lead the people Israel away from the Egyptians. Instead of leading all of them to freedom and liberty, he instead saved one of them, by destroying a single Egyptian and therefore had to flee off into the wilderness for a while. Now here with his father-in-law Jethro, he's serving just like an everyman. He's got his blue collar on and he's working the flocks and working the fields there. Verse 2 it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And the inquisitive mind of Moses leads him to go and search this thing out. I think I would think the same thing. Why is this thing burning and yet not being burnt? Verse 4, it says, And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, in other words, when the Lord acknowledged that Moses had acknowledged his vision and his um, sign, and he had turned unto him, it says, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush, and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And you go down to verse 11, it says, And Moses said unto God, who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. And it's amazing that Moses, and you can go back to Deuteronomy, at the end of all of this, you can see where he started. Moses started getting a promise from God that God would be with him. And then by the time that promise lived out his days, it was exactly what was promised. Above and beyond, Moses was able to command the law of God. He was able to rule as a king over the assembly. And yet in the beginning, he was so meek. He was so humble. He fell on his face. He thought he was not the one to lead this people or to do such a great work. But the reason why he could do such a great work, because God said, I will be with you. And I will bring this token. What will the token be? That you will succeed in leading the people out. And not only that, you'll come back here and serve God on this mountain. And Moses certainly came a long way as a result of his willingness to hear God to receive what he says, to do what he says, and to lead the people in that same way best he could. Now, of course, people were disobedient unto him, and by extension unto God, but that wasn't Moses' problem by and large. Moses, I believe, did what was right in the eyes of God best he could, and therefore he has this great testimony at the end of his days, and he's able to issue a blessing forth unto those same people he was called to lead. Now, he begins after he commands this law, and he begins after he's, he's revered as a king among Jeshurun, among God's people, when they are gathered together, to give individual blessings to each of the tribes or people group here. Now, there's a lot of prophetic utterances, and people will say that this applies to different frameworks of time, you know, from when they were first said here to now, and we can see how the 12 tribes lived these things out as they walked through um, the centuries, but I don't know a lot about the history of that, and from what I can see, basically 
everything that's indicated here ended at the time of Christ or soon after anyways when the Romans came in and sacked the whole of the nation and destroyed it. But even before that, in the time of the kings, we just read last week about how they broke up into, into two different groups. And we had the northern tribe and the southern tribe, and now they were all intermingled. And so a lot of these prophecies of blessings that were to come upon these individual tribes... I think they fall into the category of what is said in verse 5, where it says he was king in Jeshurun. You remember what we talked about with respect to Jeshurun that, uh, last week? They were the upright ones. That was the, the picture of Israel completely in God's will and doing exactly what God wants in an upright way. And so we see that very soon after Deuteronomy, we have Joshua, and he did a pretty good job at leading the people. By the time we get to Judges, I mean, it's a mess how these people are living. Then we get into the kings and the tribes break up and it just keeps getting broken and broken and diluted and diluted. I think this was a prophecy that they could have received and the blessing that they could have received in the same way that we receive blessings. How do we get that? By obedience, by following the word of God, by trusting the word of God and leading a life that is in the bounds of the commandments of God. And so while these promises were certainly made and these blessings were issued from Moses, I don't believe that every tribe received of them because I don't believe that every tribe maintained obedience unto the word of God from this time and onward. <clears throat> so I will take these scriptures then and we'll look at them in light of ourselves and we can see basically what the blessed life of obedience in Christ is. And we can see as we read through the blessings that God gave to the individual tribes, how God might bless us for the same obedience that he required of them. So, and I believe we're at liberty to do so, because look at verse 1 again. <clears throat> this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And, and from a New Testament perspective, we are spiritual Israel. And so we can take these and practically apply them to ourselves, and we're not doing something um, wrong with the Scriptures. We're simply reading them in the context of which we have. Reuben then, verse Six. Let Reuben live and not die, and let not his men be few. And so Reuben then, it said of him that the blessing he would receive is that he would live and not die. And whenever a generation lives and doesn't die, they increase. It says there that let his men not be few. And so when you're living long and you're able to see your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren and, and that you continue to flourish in that way, you multiply, you grow, and that's the same thing that the believers receive when we are faithful to God. We live. We don't die. The Bible says that we live long lives as a result of what's one thing? Obeying your parents, right? That's one of the commandments that comes with promise. And Reuben, I believe, was prophesied that he would receive the same thing in his obedience. He would multiply greatly. Verse 7, and it says, And this is the blessing of Judah. And he said, Hear, Lord, the voice of Judah, and bring him unto his people. Let his hands be sufficient for him, and be thou an help to him from his enemies. So it says of Judah, that the blessing that he would receive is that he would be brought unto his people. There would be a bond amongst his family. And that's another blessing that we can have is strong family ties. Whenever you have Christian families that are generationally so, they're stronger than most other secular families because, because that's just a blessing that God gives unto his people. And if you're a first generation Christian, you may not see that right away. But as generations go by, you'll be like Reuben and your men will not be few. You'll be like Judah and you will be gathered together into your people. It says then, let his hands be sufficient for them. I think that talks about being satisfied and being content. And that is a blessing. When we can be content with such things as we have, it's amazing how even little things that come into our lives, it's like, wow, what a blessing of God. Because I'm content with little when I receive of something that um, somebody else might seem, it might appear to be little in their sight. It's really big in my eyes. And, and I just live a more blessed life as a result. This happens all the time where I will say, praise the Lord, he, you know, provided such and such. And some people are like, eh, well, that's not really that much of a miracle. But to me, it was a really big deal. Content with what I had, saw that God provided above and beyond 
my my necessary needs, I feel blessed for it. And that's a, a staple of God's people when they have hands that are sufficient, when, when the work of their hands is sufficient for them, and they are satisfied and they are content in everything that they do. And also safety from enemies. Be thou an help to him from his enemies. And that is a wonderful blessing indeed. I don't know how many times God might have intervened in our church to keep us safe. I don't know how many times God might have intervened in our lives to keep us safe. When we're driving these roads, how often God allowed for safety when we could have been in dire uh, danger. You never know the types of miracles that God is doing behind the scenes. But that is a blessing of the believers and those that are faithful. Continues on in verse 8 and talks about Levi. It says, And Levi said, Let thy thumim and thy urim be with thy holy one, whom thou didst prove at Massa, and with whom thou didst strive at the waters of Moriah. So the Urim and the Thummim, and there's not a whole lot of information about those sayings, except that they were associated with the priest. I believe that they were used as a type of um, godly divining method. A hearing from God through these things. I don't know if it was just you know, how sometimes in the Old Testament you'd find them cast lots to determine God's will. It's basically a, an instrument that was used in the temple to discern the vision of God, what his intention was, or to have foresight of the direction of where you ought, ought to go. Now, of course, there's all sorts of um, negative connotations to this type of divination, and people use tea leaves, and people use reading your hands. This isn't what it's talking about here. But again, there's not a whole lot... A, a given in the Bibles, I believe, about these things. You go study it for yourself. But that's what you basically see is that they were an instrument given to the Levitical priesthood in order to discern or have vision or have foresight or have wisdom. And I believe God gives us that same thing. We don't have the Thummim and the Urim with us, of course, but God can, through the power of the Spirit of God, give us foresight, give us vision, determine in us a direction and, and show us what's coming to pass on and actually guide us in certain ways. You know, we can get hunches. We're, and we're not going to always trust our heart in every aspect of things that go on. But I think sometimes we know. You recognize, you know, I think God wants me to do this. And you, you feel a strong impression. And I believe that's kind of what the Thummim and the Urim would have provided for Levi in their priesthood. It's just a foresight and a discernment above, above that of people around them. Okay, in verse 9 it says, Who said unto his father and to his mother, I have not seen him, neither did he acknowledge his brethren, nor knew his own children, for they have observed thy word and kept thy covenant. They shall teach Jacob thy judgments and Israel thy law, and they shall put incense before thee and whole burnt sacrifice upon the altar. So while God was promising to Levi vision, foresight, and wisdom, he also promised that, that in their devotions, they would become teachers of all those around them. And God should be leading you to do the same, to teach people that are younger than, to teach people that are unsaved, to lead them unto Christ, to be teachers of the law and not just doers only. And this is what God provides then to Levi, vision, wisdom, and to become teachers of those around them in their devotion. Verse 11 says, Bless, Lord, his substance, and accept the work of his hands. Smite through the loins of them that rise up against him, of them that hate him, that they rise not again. Look at this great care and protection. And here Moses prays that his substance would be blessed, and the work of his hands would be blessed in the same. And Levi, as we know, didn't generally get secular jobs. Their job was to mind the priesthood and to uphold the daily devotions. And so God completely took care of them. They were given God as an inheritance. And so then that prayer there is that the substance would be cared for, the work would be cared for, and they would be protected from all of their enemies. And we can have that same protection today if we're devout and we're following after God in truth and righteousness. Continuing on in verse 12, and it says, And of Benjamin, he said, The beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him, and the Lord shall cover him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. The Lord then is by him. He, he's, he's there near him. He's, he's keeping him safe, safe at this time. 
He's a great beloved of God. God loves him and cares for him especially. There's a protection there and a covering available to Benjamin. It says that God will dwell there in between his shoulders. What's there? Your breast, your heart. God dwelling in Benjamin's heart. We have the Holy Spirit of God if we believed on Christ dwelling in our hearts. We also have, spiritually speaking, the breastplate of righteousness that guards that portion of us. And we ought to mind, be mindful to put that on every day. Think about it consciously. Putting on the breastplate of righteousness, caring for your heart and keeping your your loins and your, your, uh, your core safe from the attacks of the enemy. That's what that is. And here, Benjamin's given that blessing that God would dwell so close to him and would keep him so safe that essentially God would be there dwelling between his shoulders and upon his breast. Verse 13 says, Of Joseph, he said, Blessed of the Lord be his land for the precious things of heaven, for the dew and for the deep that coucheth beneath, and for the precious fruits brought forth by the sun and for the precious things put forth by the moon. So here, God is talking about, for Joseph, a plentiful land. Great provision, um, great substance, fruit brought forth of the sun, and so the, the sun's giving proper heat and nourishment to the fruit. Precious things are being brought forth by the moon, and the land there is being, being it's flourishing as a result of the care from heaven. Joseph here is blessed, and, and, and as a result of his, his blessing, I think he'd be able to provide for others as well. And we saw that in the story of Joseph of old and how he was brought into great rank with Pharaoh in order that he could preserve alive many of his people to many generations. Verse 16 continues and says, For the precious things of the earth and the fullness thereof, and for the good will of him that dwelt in the bush, let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph and upon the top of the head of them that was separated from the brethren. So there's a, an allusion to that story where Joseph was nearly killed, but rather sold to slavery of his brethren. And what they meant for evil, God meant for good. And though he was separated from his brethren, it was only so that he could receive of the fullness of the blessing as a result of that shows Joseph here as a strong leader. It says in verse 17, His glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns like the horns of a unicorn. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth. And they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. And so he's pushing with his horns. He's leading the charge. He's, he's essentially, through, through his glorious conquests and through his great provision, leading people at the time which is to come. Verse 18, it talks and it says, Of Zebulun, he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, in thy going out, and Issachar in thy tents. They shall call the people unto the mountains. There they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness, for they shall suck of the abundance of the seas and of treasures hid in the sand. So there's an abundance of treasures associated with Zebulun and Issachar. And they received of that through righteousness. They shall offer sacrifices of righteousness. And the Bible says that they're going to be a traveling people, I think. They are going out and they live in tents. Whenever somebody is living in a tent, it's because there's no certain habitation. They don't have a house to live in. And so they can pick up their home and move and pick up their home and move and pick up their home and move. A little bit of an association here with like the missionaries that we've seen in the last centuries where they would go out and they would have no certain home and they would try to reach people far and wide and bring those great sacrifices of righteousness and abundance of, of the seas, it says here, and treasures hid in the sand to, to all generations and to all different nations. That's Zebulun and Issachar and the blessing that they would receive. Verse 20, it says, And of Gad, he said, Blessed be he that enlargeth Gad... He dwelleth as a lion and teareth the arm with the crown of his head. So Gad then blesses others that bless him. So he's receiving of that Israel promise and that promise that went out to Abraham initially that blessed are those that bless thee and cursed are those that curseth thee. And so whoever is 
actively enlarging Gad, who's ever taking care for him, receives of a secondary blessing as a result of providing for Gad at this time. He dwells as a lion. He teareth the arm with the crown of his head. Verse 21, And he provided the first part for himself because there in a portion of the lawgiver was he seated. And he came with the heads of the people and executed the justice of the Lord and his judgments with Israel. And so he was able to sit in the seat that he was in as a result of, what do we see here? His honesty and judgment. His honesty and justice. And didn't we read about that all through Deuteronomy? To have just measures, a just hind, a just ephah. Be righteous in your judgment and be just in your justice and, and how you deal with other people. And so Gad here is reaping of that same blessing. And each one of these I see, they're basically just the blessings that we've seen in all of Deuteronomy now associated particularly with a certain tribe and a certain group. Verse 22, and it says, And of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp. He shall leap from Bashan. A lion's whelp, a young lion. He will be grown, he will be powerful one day, but there's a lot of growing for Dan to do, certainly, isn't he? If he's a lion's whelp. And each one of us can individually look at ourselves and understand that, hey, we'll be grown, we'll be strong, we'll be strengthened as we grow in this life. But ultimately, right now, we're at the... The, the youngest we'll ever be. We're a whelp in comparison to how we'll be in five years and in 10 years and, and in, in 20 years and so on and so forth. There's a lot of growing to do. And that's one of the blessings that Dan here is, is promised to receive if he's obedient, is that he will grow and he will leap from Bashan. Verse 23, and it says, And of Naphtali, he said, O Naphtali, satisfied with favor and full with the blessing of the Lord, Possess thou the west and the south. So full favor, full blessing here to Naphtali. It also talks about how he'll possess from the west into the south. And so he'll have great provision of land. And he'll have much increase in that area. As a result of what the Lord has given. It also though says here that he'll be satisfied with it. We need to think of ourselves in the same way. Get to the point where you've got enough and be satisfied therewith. Because Naphtali, he's got full favor. He's got blessing. And, and, and he's just, he's satisfied with that. He doesn't need any more than he has. And when you don't need any more, that's when God just says, okay, I'll, I'll pile a little bit on. Because God loves us to be satisfied and content with such things as we have. So he can show his great blessings to us. Verse 24, and it says, And of Asher, he said, Let Asher be blessed with children. Let him be acceptable to his brethren. And let him dip his foot in oil. There's children here. There's heritage here. There's great reward here. Dipping your feet in oil. Oil is a precious thing that it takes a whole bunch of increase in order to squish it down to get just a drop of oil. If you know anything about the production of, of oil, whether it's a seed or whether it's a plant that's being con taken into that, you have to bring in bucket loads to get just one drop of oil. And he's got enough that he can dip his foot in. Blessed with children. Let him be acceptable to his brethren. Let him dip his foot of oil. It says in verse 25, Thy shoes shall be iron and brass, and as thy days, so shall thy strength be. I've been working on a song. I just put it in our, our hymn books, and one day we'll sing it about, As thy days, so shall thy strength be. And I, I heard the song before I ever really, the, the verse caught my eye. But think about us. How, how many days do we have? Eternal. <laughs> and that's the strength that, that comes with having eternal days, is having eternal strength through the Lord God. There's great longevity here promised to Asher. It's promised to you as well, Christian. And so we continue on, and that's the finality of all of the different tribes and the, the blessings that they'll receive. And I think those promises are available to us as well as the tribes of Israel, as the children of Israel, it says in verse 1. But continues on and, and, and concludes with verse 26. And it says, There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun. So we just had Moses explaining all the blessings to be upon the people. Well, why is that the case? Because of verse 26. Because there is none like the God of Jeshurun. There is none like the God of these tribes. It says, Who rideth upon the heaven in thy help, and in his excellency 
on the sky. There is indeed none like God in his help and in his excellency toward his own people. Verse 27 says, the eternal God is thy refuge. And if he's eternal, his refuge is the same. Underneath his everlasting arms of provision and care and strength that is available for you. And it says, and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee and shall say, destroy them. God giving the command to his people to the destruction of those that would stand against them. The eternal God, eternal in his refuge. The eternal God, everlasting in his arms. The eternal God thrusting out the enemy before him is the God that we trust in and we believe on and we seek after. It says in verse 28, Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be upon a land of corn and wine. Also his heavens shall drop down do great separation from things that would hurt and harm and great safety is there in a land that is flowing with milk and honey a, a land that has great corn and wine and provision of the same fountains of living water pouring down and dew rising up out of the earth it sounds wonderful and it sounds great and it's only that way because of the god of jeshurun it's only that way because of this eternal god that we trust in and are obedient to verse 29 it says Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people saved by the Lord. Be encouraged in the same way. Happy are you, O Christians. Why? Because you're saved of the Lord. Who's like unto thee? Who can say that I am saved of the Lord God of Jeshurun? Who can say I am saved of the eternal God that has eternal arms that thrusts out all of my enemies before me. That's why you ought to be happy. Why? Because you are his. You are redeemed of him. It says the shield of thy help. And who is the sword of thy excellency? It's God Almighty. And thine enemies shall be found liars unto thee. And thou shalt tread upon their high places. Again, who is like unto our God? Who is able to care for us in the same way no one there's not a friend like the lowly jesus he's the one that makes us happy we certainly can never be despondent or depressed for too long if we meditate upon truths like this and this is what moses wanted to send forth unto his people here's a bunch of blessings and then he highlights why they're receiving of that same blessing i'll begin chapter 34 it's a conclusion chapter and it basically just iterates the transfer of, of power that's about to take place. So let's read it in verse 1. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the mountains of Nebo, to the top of Pisgah that is over against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan, and all Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim, and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah unto the utmost sea. And the south and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees unto Zoar. And the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go thither. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. So that indicates that God there buried him. In verse 7 it says, And Moses was an hundred and twenty years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. abated. That means he was still just as strong when he was twenty years old as he was this day. Though he'd aged a hundred years, his eyes still just as sharp and able to see, which is probably how he was able to get up on the top of Pisgah and see all of the nations that God had promised unto his people. I believe you can get up on certain parts of Israel and see on a clear day the farthest reach of the promised land that God had laid before them. And Moses with his sharp eye and with, with, a, with a clear day perhaps God provided. Or maybe there was some sort of spiritual uh, you know, accelerant given to being able to see this thing. But nevertheless, he saw it with his eyes even as God had promised. 
and he didn't go over thither, even as God had promised. And it says in verse 8, And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. And so, as was instructed, hands were properly laid upon Joshua, and he was sent as the leader, as God had commanded. The fullness of the Spirit and of wisdom placed upon him to lead those people. Verse 10, And there arose not a prophet since in, the, in Israel, like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And what a blessing that is to think of, how God instructed Moses and, penned, and, and had him pen these first five books in Revelation unto us after instruction face to face to face. I don't know if Moses kept a notebook or, or how he was able to, to keep it so, or if God just later had him dictate those things, but... Nevertheless, Moses knew God face to face. And we saw their, their great relationship that they had and that Moses would often fight back with God and reason with them and try to, try to you know, see things eye to eye with him, as it were. Nevertheless, he was faithful. And there was no prophet like him in that way that was able to reason and interact with God in such a fashion. Verse 11, it says, "...in all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh..." and to all his servants, and to all his land, and in, all that the, that, and in all that mighty hand, and in all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel. What a great conclusion here we have. It's just, just God giving opportunity for Moses to be lifted up again after he's buried and after he passes away. A lot of scholars, I think, believe that those last few verses were actually penned by Joshua, you know, because we saw Moses buried in verse 4, 5, and 6. And so, so then this was kind of like his, his obituary at the end there in verse 7. Um, they didn't have a, a tombstone, of course, but they, they could certainly remember him in this fashion by putting it in the scriptures. But nonetheless, it's just a great, a great uh, just, just final wrap-up of Moses' life, showing his faithfulness. Showing his strength even unto the end of his days. Showing that he left behind him a leader that was full of spirit and wisdom in order to carry on his work. A man that saw God face to face and, and interacted with him in that ways. Where God trusted him to, be, to show signs and to show wonders and to show a mighty hand and, and great terrors of God unto all the people. There was none like unto Moses. And, and that's what's, what's highlighted here as we reflect back upon the book that we just read and studied through. So I'm thankful for God for, for giving this to us. It, it's been a great study. Um, pray about where we'll go next um, and that it be as, as fruitful as the book of Deuteronomy was.